All right, so welcome everybody. Hi, good to see everybody on Zoom. Good to see everybody here. Um, glad you're here. I wanna dedicate this talk to all of the Japanese and Chinese ancestors that brought this Dharma here. We're so, so fortunate. Uh, we celebrated or acknowledged Kedigiri Roshi's passing today. And uh, I just feel so lucky that my teacher, for my teachers and my teacher's teachers, and I want to dedicate this talk to the ending of suffering for all people every year. Whether I know them or not, whether they're convenient, whether they're easy to love or hard to love. So, thank you. So, yesterday um, we had a Zazen Kai, and um, I'm, just, I'm so happy. It's like, hello, everybody. I'm so glad to see everybody. Um, it was really great. It's like a little mini session, you know, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. And, um, you know, I, I've been doing this practice for a while, and I, I you know, like it all comes down to uh, suffering and the end of suffering. I mean, that's why we're here today, right? You want to end suffering, there's, the, there's that discomfort inside, there's that place of not knowing, there's the all kinds of stuff going on in the world. And so how can I um, end my own suffering? And those in the, everybody in the world, right? So it's been through the practice of sitting, but it's not just sitting by myself, it's sitting in community. Because with the support of the Sangha, with the support of my teacher, I feel like I've been able to get at, you know, some of those stickier parts of myself that um, I was not able to get to um, before. And still, you know, it's a work in progress. In a couple, isn't it a couple of weeks they have the Jukai ceremony? Isn't it week after next? Yeah. So what I wanted to do today, well, I kind of got a two-fold thing going, but I want to talk a little bit about um, refuge, or like we, we yesterday we read the grass root hermitage. I'm gonna read a little bit of that. And then I wanna talk about, you know, what is it to take refuge? And then what 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 are we doing with these um what are we doing with these precepts anyway? Like why 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 even why do you want to do that? What's what's the point? So I want to talk a little bit about that. I wanna start by uh, reading. And then, of course, there's got to be some roomy. There's got to be a little music. How long do I have, by the way? And then, could somebody make the clock where I can see it? I sure will. Please. So, how? So, I don't remember how long I'm, I'm supposed to talk. Can you guys remind me? George, anybody know? Usually, it's like 11:30. Isn't it? Okay. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to drag it on. So, like 11:15, 11 11:30-ish. 11 okay. Sure. All right. So. So the just for context, and I always like some of some of this stuff. I don't want to be too boring, but the context of the grass roof hermitage is uh, it was written by a monk. She to Zik Zikian. She to Zikian. He was an early Chinese Zen master. He was called one of Zen's two great jewels. The other one was Mazu Dayu. For some years, he meditated continually in a hut built on a rock at, na, at the Nan Monastery. So he was called the Priest Rock Head. But he, he is the author of the Song of the Grass Roof Hermitage. So I want to read it first, and then I want to, I'll talk a little bit about it. I built a grass hut where there's nothing of value. After eating, I relax and enjoy a nap. When it was completed, fresh weeds appeared. Now it has been lived in, covered by weeds. You know, do you think it would be helpful? Would you guys like to have a copy of it? Because we'd have a whole bunch of copies out there, would you like? No? Okay. <laughs> All right. Now it's been lived in, covered by weeds. The person in the hut lives here calmly, not stuck to inside, outside, or in between. Places worldly people live, he doesn't live. Realms worldly people love, he doesn't love. Though the hut is small, it includes the entire world. In 10 feet square, an old man illumines forms and their nature. 
a great vehicle bodhisattva trusts without doubt. The middling or lowly can't help wondering, will this hut perish or not? Perishable or not, the original master is present, not dwelling south or north, east or west, firmly based on steadiness. It can't be surpassed. A shining window below the green pines. Jade palaces of a million towers can't compete with it. Just sitting. With head covered, all things are at rest. Thus, this mountain monk doesn't understand at all. Living here, he no longer works to get free. Who would proudly arrange seats trying to entice guests? Turn around the light to shine within and then just return. The vast inconceivable source can't be faced or turned away from. Meet the ancestral teachers. Be familiar with their instruction. Bind grasses to build a hut. Don't give up. Let go of hundreds of years and relax completely. Open your hands and walk innocent. Thousands of words, myriad interpretations are only to free you from obstruction. If you want to know the undying person in the hut, don't separate from this skin bag right here and now. So sitting in the hut, part of sitting in the hut when we sit Zazen, I mean, I think of that, sitting in a hut, having a hermitage. Has anybody ever gone on a silent retreat somewhere out in the wilderness? Okay, a little bit of you. Yeah, silent retreat for sure. But I think in that process, even in our daily meditation practice, when we, we sit and we face the wall or we don't face the wall, but when we sit, and we're still, just for a moment, we take refuge in this place of solitude and silence, the inside of ourselves. The whole point of doing that, because people ask me, like, why, why would you sit and stare at the floor? Why would you sit and stare at the wall? To end suffering. It's to know the nature of my own mind. Like people, like if you watch your mind go and go and go and go and go, right? You get to know the nature of it. You get to understand the nature of it so that when things come up, when I'm out in the real world, I can recognize, oh, like Thich Nhat Hanh says, oh, hello, my little anger. Hello, my friend. I know you. You know, like to make friends with myself, to make friends with those parts of myself that I'm not so crazy about. Make friends with the part that's just trying to like rest control when I don't know what's happening. So we can say, I have built a grass hut where nothing, there's nothing of value. Often in Zen meditation, we talk about it's good for nothing sitting. So we're not trying to get something. We're not trying to gain something. It's not like we're trying to, um, like often people think um, that sitting, sitting meditation, and for some people it is, that there's a, that, that, um, that there's a, I'm looking for a specific end in mind. And and the, the teaching of Zen is that the sitting itself is the end. In the practice, there's no difference between practice and realization. That in the practice that we are at once realized, whether we realize it or not. That the value of one person sitting is worth more than all of the sands, the grains of sands in the Ganges River. So we sit, we create this hermitage, even if it's just our daily practice, we go and we sit. That's the thing that it's like um, we can, and this, <laughs> the very end, it says, myriad, where is it? Thousands of words, myriad interpretations are only to free you from obstruction. So that's all that we're trying to get to is we're trying to get like, how do I get to the root of my suffering and resolve it and find a way through it and find that there is a way out of suffering. So we sit on a daily basis and it's in that sitting that practice of realization, that daily committed practice. And even if it's a weekly practice for you, whatever it is, that practice that you do on a daily basis, that's the thing that for me starts to untwist the 
the knots that are inside that I get to see like, okay, this is the nature of my mind. This is what I, this is the nature of greed. This is the nature of grasping. This is the nature of delusion. This is the nature of hatred. I, all of those, you know, like they talk about those as the three poisons is greed, hatred, and delusion. Most of that is rooted in survival. Greed, hatred, and delusion. Because if I'm afraid that I'm not going to have enough, you know, that's the, that's kind of what's underneath for me. That's feel like, but that's what's underneath all of that fear, all of that grasping is I'm afraid I'm not going to be okay. That's why I start grabbing on to stuff. That's why I start to try to rest control. I'm afraid I'm not going to be okay. So if I can let go of that, if I can let go of thousands, what is it? Let go of hundreds of years, let go of hundreds of years and relax completely. I heard a story. My teacher went to go uh, train in France at the Thich Nhat Hanh Monastery. And she talked to one of the monks there. And she said, you know, because you're always wondering, like, what's your practice? What's your practice? She's like, what's your practice? And he said, my practice is to relax as completely as I can. To relax as completely as I can. You notice when you're like, I went to, um, I, was so, I was lucky enough uh, or, uh, late last year to go to Hawaii for the first time. Does anybody, like, you know, you guys have a favorite place you go to on vacation? I hope so. And it's a place where you can let go completely. It's a place where you can relax. Maybe it's in the country. Maybe it's when you go for your walk in the woods. Whatever it is, nature has the, for me, has the ability to like help me relax and know that everything's okay. So just think for a minute, remember what it's like to be in that place of complete relaxation. Very often on the cushion, it takes a long time to get to that place of complete relaxation. Usually I sit down and the mind is like, I'm like busy. I don't know, but for you all, that is for me. And then, and that's why I do session because it takes a while for that to just sort of like the sand in the, if you have a, a, a you know, like a, a can of rocks and sand and you shake it up, you know, all of that stuff is right there. That's like it. That's what it's like. And what happens over a period of time and after a while is that, the stuff tends to settle down to the bottom, but it takes a while. It takes a while. It takes a while. Um, it takes a while. <laughs> so when you're in that place of complete relaxation, you know, when I've stopped struggling to try to get my body to be perfect, when I've stopped struggling to try to get my mind to be quiet, when I'm just there relaxing as completely as I can, the, I believe it's the people, I think, or perhaps it's the Tibetan tradition that talk about calm abiding. That I can be with myself just as things are in this place of stillness, of quiet, of rest. Then, hopefully, the whole point is I can respond in a way that's skillful. I like what the Buddhists say when they talk about, you know, like, uh, you know, like if uh, somebody blows up or gets angry, it's like they don't go. <laughs> maybe they do, and maybe they do, and they're privately. They don't go. That guy's just a jerk. <laughs> they say, "Oh, that was unskillful action." You know, so that you can separate your action from who you know, like who you actually are, because the root of the teaching is that we are all Buddhas. That we have that ability to wake up, and the reason that we sit, the reason that we're together, you know, the reason we rely, we take refuge on Buddha and Dharma and Sangha to wake up to who we really are so that then we can act in that way. Firmly based on steadiness. Talking in this hut, perishable or not, the original master is present, not dwelling in south or north or east or west, firmly based on steadiness. It can't be surpassed. A shining window below the green pines, jade palaces or vermilion towers can't compare with it. So when I feel like we have these little moments, I feel like I have these little moments of touching reality. Little moments, it's a, something that I know and then I don't. I wanna read a couple of Rumi poems. 
This is the one with a story water. You can tell this book is well worn. I started reading Rumi back in 1998 when I first started teaching yoga. And I still, I used to just open it up on random, at a random and, uh, and look at, and just see what came up. Sort of like a, help me with my day. Here it is, story water. A story is like water that you heat for your bath. It takes messages between the fire and your skin. It lets them meet. And it cleans you. Very few can sit down in the middle of the fire itself, like a salamander or Abraham. We need intermediaries. A feeling of fullness comes. But usually it takes some bread to bring it. Beauty surrounds us, but usually we need to be walking in a garden to know it. The body itself is a screen to shield and partially reveal the light that's blazing inside your presence. Water, stories, the body, all the things we do are mediums that hide and show what's hidden. Study them and enjoy this being washed with a secret that we sometimes know and then not. You notice that? You know, like you get, you're, you're like, I, 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 I think I got it, I think I got it. The, the Rinzai people talk about little Ken shows, these little, little baby awakenings of like, little by little by little by little we awaken. And I think that there's, um, there's a book called uh, The Variety of uh, Religious Experiences not remembering the uh, author now, William but he talked. <laughs> yeah. Who is it? James? Who is it? William James. That's it. William James. Okay. I had the James part. I couldn't William remember James. the William part. Hey, hey, got it. And, you know, he talks about like there are these different kinds of awakenings. Some of them are like these big flood of awakenings and some of them are these gradual, slow, very slow, painfully slow awakenings. And I feel like that's the kind of awakening actually that has more value. You know, because in a moment, in a flash, I can think, oh, I've got it. I'm awakened. This is awesome. Because sometimes it's, sometimes in session, you know, I'll look out and I'll see the trees of the sky or something. And I'll be like, oh, my God, this is so beautiful. Oh, my God, it's so awesome. But then I don't know how to go and, like, not get mad when things don't come my way. Or I'm still <laughs> suffering with that. You know, or, like, people, somebody throws something in there. And it's just like, you know, one of my friends, Kyoku Wallen, she's a really awesome teacher. Um, now she's at Hokio Zen practice community. And she said, you know, the, the thing that you ought to be able to do as a priest is you ought to be able to turn on a dime. You ought to be able to pivot in a moment. You know, and George reminded me of that this morning, you know, you ought to be able to just pivot in a moment, like change, it's different, big deal. Okay, we can deal with it. We can, you know, we know how to do this. This is okay. This is not a catastrophe. This is not an emergency. We know how to deal with it. That's most of life. And and the and and I think that the the teachings and mostly the practice of sitting and being with myself and being with you all and learning how to bump up against each other and you know be, be try to be a kind human being is learning how to like turn down the fire of that it's danger danger warning warning you know everything is not an emergency I have to remind myself of that constantly I think you know I just grew up with a very sensitive nervous system you know where it feels like ah you know like, I'm like oh, no, it's okay it's all right everything's all right mm -hmm. and the uh I want to do another this is another I want to do another I'm going to do a couple of more poems because I think that Rumi says it way better than I could so this is of 265 it's worms awakening worms waking if you guys had this book Rumi's the Essential Rumi by Coleman Barthes. It's uh, the translation by Coleman Barthes. So it's like this, this gradual awakening. Here it is. The worm's waking. This is how a human being can change. As a worm 
addicted to eating grape leaves. Suddenly he wakes up. She wakes up, they wake up. Call it grace, whatever, something wakes them and they no longer are a worm. They are the entire vineyard and the orchard too, the fruit, the trunks, a growing wisdom and joy that doesn't need to devour. I promised you I'd talk to the about the precepts. So for me, this um, this poem about bird wings is about you know kind of the process of being in zazen. How um, whatever I'm sitting there, it's difficult for whatever reason, and rather than try to change it or resist it or control it or try to fix it. I mean, sitting zazen is a metaphor, of, like a, a metaphor we work out in our bodies for our lives, you know? So rather than trying to fix it or control it or shift it or change it or make it where I'm uncomfortable, if I can just be there and be present. And I'm not, I mean, I'm not. <laughs> One of my, my friend, Judith Regeer says, you know, please like admit to people that you don't know how to do it either. You know, like I'm still learning. It's not like, oh, I am so, I'm like, I am so, I have figured this one out. But I, at least I know, I, I can see the path. I can see the way there. And every once in a while for a moment, I feel like I can touch it. I can grab it, I can let it go. And that feeling of, That feeling, I feel like I, I do know just for a moment, like why I'm here is not the right word, but how I'm here and how we can all be together, how we can be in community. Here it is, bird wings. Your grief for what you've lost lifts up a mirror to where you're bravely working. Expecting the worst you look, and instead, here's the joyful face you've been wanting to see. Your hand opens and closes and opens and closes. If it were always a fist or always stretched open, you'd be paralyzed. Your deepest presence is in every small contracting and expanding. Your deepest presence, I'm adding this, is in that awareness of every breath in and every breath out. The two as beautifully balanced and coordinated as bird wings. All right, I'm not going to be able to catch all of the 16 uh, precepts, but I will talk about the first six. The first, what is considered the first three precepts are taking refuge. Isn't that awesome? Taking a refuge. Like, how do I, how do I keep, how do I, you know, taking refuge, taking refuge in Buddha, in my own ability to awaken, taking refuge in Dharma, in the teachings that reveal themselves in every moment and also in all the thousands of words that are used to try to help wake us up. I take refuge in Sangha. When we talk about, uh, I take refuge in Buddha. There's um, at the beginning of Sashin and um, actually in the morning service at Clouds, we say, I take refuge in Buddha. May all beings embody the great way, resolving to awaken. I take refuge in Dharma. May all beings deeply enter the truth. I take refuge in Sangha, may all beings support harmony in the community. So may I act in a way that 
is helpful, not hurtful. I was talking to Ken earlier. I'm like, it helps no one if I'm an ass. <laughs> it helps no one. It doesn't help me. It doesn't help you. It doesn't help. It doesn't make anything happen any better. You know, I might get my way for a second, but it's not helpful. So the three pure precepts, these I can, I, I love the three, the three pure precepts. Don't do evil. Don't be a jerk. Don't do evil. Don't do harm. Don't be mean, you know, like, and when you do try to make amends as quickly as possible, try to make it right. Admit when you're wrong. So the difference between making people, and you guys know this, I'm sure, but the difference between making amends and saying, I'm sorry, are worlds apart. Usually in my history, my history, I would say like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm such a piece of crap. You know, like when I like would be some do something mean, um, especially because I've dealt with anger a lot and not just like it's fine to feel angry, but it's not okay to take it out on other people. Working on that. So um, what I would do is I'd be like, I, I would just like beat myself up and be like, oh, God, I just suck. I suck. I suck. And that would that would entrench the same harmful behavior. So when I go back and say, Ah, that was unskillful action. I can address it more quickly and I can admit when I'm wrong because it's not like I'm just, guess what? Newsflash. I'm just a human being making a mistake and trying to make it right. I'm just, I want to keep trying to make a little progress, a little progress, a little progress. So don't do harm. Do good. Do the stuff you know. Do what's in front of you to do. Save all beings. That's pretty lofty, hey? You know, just try to be a good person and help other people. So I want to end with I brought my mandolin back from Appleton with me. I forgot it the first time. So y'all have been here what a month and a half, something like that. Maybe a little more now. And uh and on the on the, the day that I decided to come, uh a big storm was rolling in and I kind of had to get out of town quickly so I could make it here. So um so, uh, so I wrote this song um, for actually for a friend of mine's uh, uh, a sermon she did at the UU, which I didn't. It was uh, I think it was like, "Have you touched the earth today?" And uh, I'm just gonna double check on the tuning. It's called um, "I Return to the Earth" because I don't know if you know when I when all else fails, go for a walk outside. <laughs> you know when all else fails, like breathe some air. You know, and let and let the birds sing to you. You know, when all else fails. You know, when Buddha, it's said that when uh, Buddha became awakened, a couple of things happened. Uh, the story is he's sitting under the Bodhi tree. Y'all probably know this story. He's sitting under the Bodhi tree, and um, I think you know maybe he's really close to becoming enlightened. Or realizing the way and uh and pretty soon there's a character called mara mara is uh i don't know in uh he's the guy that's getting buddha to doubt himself so what he does is he brings all kinds of temptations you know beautiful women wonderful food you know you can have all the riches in the world you want and Buddha's like, yeah, no, yeah, it's fine. I don't need any of that. I'm good. But then, this comes up for me a lot. Then Mark comes and says, sorry, this one's being a little tricky. Who are you to say, who are you to think that you can wake up? Who are you to say? that you can know the ultimate truth. The story goes, not, not cooperating. Buddha touched the earth. He said, I call on the earth as my witness that I am a good person, that I am worthy of this awakening. And the story goes, <laughs> that, oh boy, that all of the, um, sorry y'all, that all of the earth spirits woke up, I'm so sorry, I just spilled water and uh, and said, well, thank you for joining me. The, they woke up and they and they they vouched for the Buddha. They said, this is a good human being. 
this is a good man. Thank you, Water Spirits, for joining me. <laughs> Thank you, Ken, for your help. I'm so sorry. Oh, man. Anyway, so even as uh, as fallible and uh, as we are, as I am, the earth is vouching for us. I think that's it. You know, the earth is vouching for us. The earth is always here for us saying, remember, remember who you are. Remember that you're lovable. Remember that you are a good person. Remember at your core. Because sometimes when I see when people say, you are a Buddha, doesn't mean that much to me. But when they, you know, and like, you are a good person. You are a worthy human being. So this is called, I return to the earth. And usually it does sound better on a guitar. I tried to get a guitar today, but I couldn't find one. <laughs> Running in the tall grass in the heat of the summer. I feel the heat pressing on all sides. I lie down and look up at the jungle above me. Grasshoppers jumping all around. I return to She returns to me. I return to the earth. She returns me to me. Walking in the woods on a crisp fall morning. Brown and yellow leaves crunching underfoot. I breathe in and smell the damp earth beneath me, bringing me the promise of a brighter day. I return to the earth. She returns to me. I return to. Returns me to me, standing on the edge of a lake on a cold, clear winter night. Full moon reflected in the water, standing there in the air, I can feel the stillness seeping into me. I return to the earth. She returns to me. I return to the earth. She returns me to me. In the heat of the summer. Crisp fall morning in the stillness of the night. I return to the earth. End with that, and then um, if anybody has any thoughts or ideas or like, how do you find refuge? What do the precepts mean to you? How is it when you are in your practice? <clears throat> well, what you were talking about, how like taking refuge um, can look like when we sit and we just completely let go. Um, and that can be really difficult <laughs> sometimes. And especially, I mean, for like, if you have a tendency to like ruminate and like in, you know, anxious thoughts, like those kind of circular thought patterns that happen. And 
I've, for me, in addition to just the practice of just on its face, trying to let go of thoughts, just seeing them as thoughts and, you know, kind of, you know, not merging with them, but observing them is helpful. But also for me was to kind of interrogate, uh -huh. like, why, why do I engage with this? Why uh -huh. do I keep doing this if I don't prefer this? Uh -huh. And, uh -huh. um, I don't know. I don't know how it is for everybody, but for me, for a long time, I almost felt like, um, that kind of ruminating and the, the anxious thinking, the worrying was somehow like productive. Mm -hmm, like if mm -hmm. I had my mind on it all the time, then I could like somehow, but that's, it's not like, it's so like, it's, you're not solving problems. You're not doing anything practical. And so once I was able to like, see that piece of it, I was able to let go more. A lot of anxious thinking, a lot of worrying like that just simply has to do with fear of uncertainty uh -huh. like and so in that way it's kind of like avoiding you know the I don't know it's avoiding uncertainty by engaging in this not productive <laughs> activity but then you know I don't know being with uncertainty I think has been more my practice than lately because so there are two things that makes me think of one is it reminds me when I first heard about I think the, the called Vipassana meditation and um, and they're like what you're supposed to do is one of the things like you're supposed to do when you like notice what's going is you're supposed to go thinking thinking and I'd be like thinking thinking <laughs> like you <laughs> dumbass like quit thinking it didn't was not helpful so when I get into that ruminating thing what I try to do is I drop into the body mm -hmm. and that tends to help me but I'm with you looking deeply I mean Dogen talks about that looking deeply at the self to study the self is notice self to be, know the self to be like enlivened by all of the things in the world. Any other thoughts? Anybody online want to say anything? We lost yeah, it. hi, it's Vicky. Hi, hey, Vicky. Um, hey, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. So I have learned that uh, the reason that we ruminate with anxious thoughts, <clears throat> sorry, I'm still recovering from a cold, um, is it has a secondary gain. From an evolutionary standpoint, if we think there's a tiger in the bush, we're going to stare at it and our survival doesn't care if we're wrong or embarrassed. We would rather be safe than sorry. So if our attention is on it, then it's serving a purpose for us. And that's why it's hard for us to let go. And that was really helpful to me when I was suffering from anxiety, um, uh, a lot of anxiety in my past to know that's why I'm doing that. I am getting some benefit out of it, or at least I think I am. My, my brain is wanting to be in control. And the way I'm in control is by focusing on this potential tiger in the bush. Thanks, Vicki. Anybody else here want to add anything? Anybody else online? Everything. I, I, I think. Yes. So, just on the same topic of recognizing, you know, thoughts and <clears throat> ruminations and that. Some sometimes what I do is when I become aware of this, just okay, welcome, welcome. You're welcome to. You're welcome to whatever. I mean, this is because it is. It's just the mind. It's like the heart beating. It's just the mind doing its shit. You know. So just making that space for it. So that takes me out of the judgment and the thinking, you know what I mean? It takes uh -huh. you out of the judgment. Uh -huh. Just go, welcome, okay, you're, okay, fine, you're welcome, you too, okay. So that's something that helps me. Thank you. All right, I've got one more quote I wanna read y'all, and then we will shut her down. All right, so this is, uh, this is from uh, Joaquin, who lived in the 1700s, and it's a way of, taking the practice off the cushion and into the world. Make your upper garments into a robe. Make your chair your sitting cushion. Make the mountains, rivers, the great earth, the sitting platform. Make the whole universe your own personal medication meditation cave. This is the true practice of the sages from the past and of today. So do we do the three, we do the three refuges and then we do three bows? Yes. So okay. Anybody? Any, 
Last chance. Thank you. Thank you.